everybody and welcome to uh, the BCS Oxfordshire's uh, monthly meeting. Um, just before we, we delve into tonight's meeting, uh, I'd like to just advertise um, the meeting on the 11th of March, which is uh, Making Technology Inclusive for All. We have a, a speaker from AbilityNet who's coming to talk about um, basically how to uh, use technology to support uh, people with disabilities. So that I think should be uh, be interesting. Uh, other than that, I don't think I've got any particular notices. So we'll move on to tonight's event. Um, and I'm very pleased to uh, welcome Professor Carl Fry from the Oxford Marketing uh, School uh, at the University of Oxford. Uh, Professor Fry is the Oxford Martin City Fellow and is co-director of the Oxford Martin Programme for Technology and Employment. Um, when we were putting this programme together, uh, obviously AI and its impact on our lives, and particularly our jobs, was quite high profile in the news. Um, unfortunately, it's been eclipsed a little bit by COVID and the like, like everything else these days. Uh, but I think as we move to get back to normal, it will uh, again raise its profile and how automation and the like is going to affect all our lives. So without further ado, I'll hand over to uh, Carl and uh, let him give our presentation tonight. Thank you very much, Carl. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Brian. Um, I hope you can see me and uh, that you can see my slides as well. Uh, if not, uh, please do let me know. Um, so the technology trap uh, came out with Princeton University Press back in 2019. So as you mentioned, Brian, uh, it came out pre-pandemic. So what I thought I'll do in um, uh, during the next 45 minutes or so is sort of take you through the argument of the book and then sort of end on how some of the points I've been making in the book uh, have been impacted by the pandemic. And I actually think that overall COVID-19 have made many of these uh, issues more important rather than uh, less important. So the key question that I tried to uh, answer in the book is should we feel concerned if the future of automation mirrors the past? Um, as many of you will have noted, uh, the debate uh, today is quite polarized on many issues uh, and the same is true of automation and technological unemployment. So there is a significant group, mostly technologists, that feel that artificial intelligence is going to make a lot of jobs redundant. And there are even people arguing that this time is entirely different. We are really entering uh, a world without work. Um, on the other hand, you tend to have mostly economists and historians arguing that, well, uh, if we look to the past 200 years, we have had mechanization and automation for a long time. And if anything, we're richer and better off and have more comfortable um, and convenient jobs uh, to go to. And we haven't really seen sort of anything of the employment apocalypse that has so often been predicted. Um, and what I try to do in the book is to give this a bit more nuance because I think there is a tendency to take history and lump it all together, one long episode since the first industrial revolution. But what I argue in the book is that there have been very different episodes of technological change, depending on the types of technologies we've been seeing entering the workplace. And I argue that those technologies can be broadly categorized as either 
enabling or replacing. Enabling technologies tend to create new industries, new occupations, tend to augment workers in existing tasks, whereas replacing technologies tend to replace workers in existing occupations um, and industries, thereby putting downward pressure on the demand for labor, on jobs and people's wages. And, and the second point I make in the book is that periods of more replacing technological change have been more disruptive, have been more uh, polarized, and have from time to time even seen episodes of social um, unrest. Um, and at times people have actually uh, tried to resist these technologies over unemployment uh, concerns. Uh, one famous example is obviously the riots, uh, Luddite riots during the first industrial revolution. But as I point out in the book, uh, they were only part of a long wave of riots that swept across Brit Britain, continental Europe, and, and even China. And, and one point I try to make is that uh, resistance to technologies that threaten people's jobs and skills have been the historical norm rather than the exception. So the craft guilds, for example, which were pervasive in Europe for 700 years up until the Industrial Revolution, uh, often resisted technologies that they felt threatened their jobs and skills. And fearing social unrests, monarchs and the political elites often actually sided with the craft goals. And as a consequence of that, the adoption of replacing technologies was very slow during this period of time. Economic growth was slow as well. Um, and the last key point of the book is on the basis of that, Luddite efforts to avoid short-term replacement can actually deny us the long-run gains from these technologies. So I think we shouldn't you know, take the continuation of automation and technological progress at all for granted, especially if technology is of the replacing type. One example, which I start actually the first chapter of the book with, which I think sort of illustrates the main argument quite nicely, is the case of the lamplighters. So not so long ago, uh, in the early 19th century, uh, lamplighters actually walked the streets in the evenings with torches and ladders and ignited the gas uh, lights uh, in the evening to keep our streets bright at night. That was true in Oxford, that was true in London, that was true um, across cities uh, in Britain um, and Europe. Um, and naturally, most of us welcomed the switch to electric light. It made our cities brighter um, and better. But for the lamplighters who used to be able to support themselves and their families uh, by uh, lighting these gas lights um, in the evening, from them, this was not necessarily a beneficial technology. And for that reason, it was also resisted in some places. So for example, in Brussels, uh, lamplighters took to the streets for the fear of losing their jobs. Uh, when the local government um, deployed another group of lamplighters to take their jobs, the situation escalated. It ended with the lamplighters raiding police headquarters and, and the army had to be sent in to resolve the situation. And, and I think it's important for us as economists and economic historians in particular to uh, clarify and to explain that when we look at figures like this one, which sort of plots GDP per capita over very long periods of time, it looks like you know everything was pretty lousy for a long period of time. And then along comes the Industrial Revolution 
with the mechanized factory, which allows us to produce more with fewer workers. And after that, we're just getting richer and richer and richer. And we're so much better off uh, today. That it's just unbelievable. Uh, and that story is <clears throat> certainly true to some extent, but it's a long run story. And as John Maynard Keynes pointed out, in the long run, we're all dead. And the people that actually lived through these episodes of labor replacing technology didn't necessarily get the benefits from them. Um, and I think the first industrial revolution really illustrates this. So clearly people had very different views on whether industrialization was a good thing uh, or a bad thing, even as it took off. So writing back in 1844, Benjamin Desrieli, before he came prime, became prime minister, published a novel called Coningsby, in which one character remarks that, um, I see cities peopled with machines. Certainly Manchester must be the most wonderful place in modern times. And during the very same year, Frederick Engels published his book on the condition of the working class uh, in England. And Engels, needless to say, had a very different view of what uh, machines were doing to labor in Britain. He argued that they only um, served to deprive ordinary people of their jobs, put downward pressures on wages, um, and essentially only benefited a few industrialists. And um, now we know from history that Engels was wrong about the long run, but it was actually fairly on target about the period he lived through. Because even as the British economy took off and um, GDP uh, per capita expanded by some 50% between 1770 and 1840, wages were stagnant, probably even falling at the lower end of the income distribution. The wage data for this period, it should be said, isn't great. But if we look at other indicators of well-being, such as people's heights, which sort of is provide an indication of people's nutrition, what we do see is that the co cohorts born in 1770 were actually taller than the cohorts born in 1850. So people grew shorter by the generation during this period of time. And if we look at how people reacted to the mechanization process, that provides some indication as well. It's not like most people welcome the spread of the mechanized factory. The Luddite riots, uh, which I mentioned, is just one example of many of how people resisted the mechanized factory. And beyond rioting and smashing machinery, they frequently petitioned to parliament to block the introduction of new technologies. Uh, but the British uh, government had very lit little interest in anything of the sort. They worried about Britain's competitive position in trade and that rising wages in Britain might undermine it. So they actually, on uh, a number of occasions, even deployed the army to counteract the riots. And the army that Wellington took against Napoleon in the Peninsula War of 1808 was actually smaller than the army that uh, was deployed against uh, the Luddites. Now, the point of the book is certainly not that we're experiencing um, this all over again. But we are arguably in something that can be called another techno uh, technological uh, revolution with advanced robotics and artificial intelligence. And in many ways, this is a continuation of um, some trends we've been seeing uh, since the 1980s when the computer revolution uh, really took off and began to have an impact 
on the labor market. And what we can see um, if we look at the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of income inequality in Britain and the United States, we see that levels of income inequality have been approaching levels that we haven't uh, been seeing since uh, the first industrial revolution. Um, and computerization uh, is a part of that story. Yes, obviously, you know, computer technology goes back uh, a lot further. But the ENIAC, for example, the first electronic computer, which was invented at the University of Pennsylvania, consisted of something like 18,000 vacuum tubes. And as a consequence, it had virtually no impact on employment at all. It really took the microprocessor and the personal computer for computers to become sufficiently small and cheap to begin to have an impact on the workplace. And we can see this when we look at trends in the labor market. So it used to be the case uh, in the United States and across Western Europe that when productivity grew, uh, wages grew in tandem. You can see that wage growth, which is the um, red line, tracks uh, real GDP per hour very well throughout most of the 19th century up until um, around 1980 which suggests that technological change was primarily of the enabling type up until then. You can think of many of machines in factories required a lot of operatives which have gradually been uh, replaced. And, and as a consequence, this gap between uh, wage growth and productivity growth has opened up. And if we look more in detail on the wage distribution, um, and again, this is data from the United States, you will find similar uh, trends in Britain as well, but not as pronounced. So what you see here is that wages essentially rose at all ranks for college dropouts, from high school dropouts to uh, college graduates. Um, in the 1960s and early 1970s and what you see then is the oil price shock where wages essentially stagnate for everyone and beginning in the 1980s you see this gap emerging between uh, high school uh, dropouts and people with no more than a high school degree and people with a college degree and the gap is by far most pronounced among men who would have taken on jobs in factories before automation took off. And this is not just a story of rising inequality. I think it's important to note. As you see on this figure here, the wages for men without uh, uh, more than a high school degree has actually been have actually been falling by almost 30 percent since um, 1980. So arguably the earnings capacity of certain groups in the labor market has been permanently reduced as was the case during the first industrial revolution when the artisan shop was replaced by the mechanized factory. And I think that if we want to understand why our societies are so polarized and why politics is so polarized, well, we actually need to understand what's going on in the labor market as well. Because not every place, not every factory, not every city has automated away jobs to the same extent. And if you look at the United States, for example, what you do find is that the use of robots is very concentrated in a few states. Those being Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, and, and Pennsylvania. Michigan alone actually has more robots than the entire um, American West. And if we want to understand 
outcomes like the 2016 presidential election where um, when Trump, Donald Trump, surprised everybody by winning. What uh, was most surprising about that was actually precisely that Michigan, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, which had been part of the so-called blue wall um, and had opted for the Democratic candidate every election since 1992, uh, all of a sudden ended up being won by uh, President Trump. And what we show in this paper here is that electoral districts that were more exposed to robots were more likely to opt for President Trump. Now, obviously, um, President Trump wasn't talking much about automation. He was talking about um, Chinese imports uh, stealing American jobs. And there is some evidence for that, but China actually primarily affected the United States in southern states. Uh, the Rust Belt story is a story of automation. And the rise of China, I think it's important to remember, has already happened. It can't happen twice. Most people now work in non-traded sectors of the economy that are not that exposed to foreign imports any longer, but that doesn't mean that they are less exposed to automation. Think of the jobs of truck drivers, of receptionists, of cashiers. All those jobs are potentially automatable, but they cannot be offshored. And in terms of artificial intelligence, and robotics, I think it's fair to say that we have seen nothing yet. Um, the trends that I just shown you in the labor market is for a period when automation was basically confined to rule-based repetitive tasks that are, can easily be specified in computer code and therefore readily automated. But with machine learning becoming more pervasive, the potential scope of automation has also become much broader. Things like driving a car, medical diagnostics, document review, translation work, all of these things were way out of the capabilities of computers 10, 15 years ago. They're now becoming increasingly automatable. Now, some of you might, of course, say, well, driverless cars haven't been been talking about them for a long time and where are they and google translate well i used it yesterday it's far from perfect but i think it's important to remember that every revolution in technology has started with imperfect technology the steam engine which powered much of the first industrial uh, industrial revolution was um were merely used to drain coal mines in their early days and even that they didn't do particularly well yet as coal um, efficiency or energy efficiency improved they gradually came to power factories across britain and i think the same is true for uh, artificial intelligence uh, many one of the main limitations today is that AI is usually data inefficient. We need huge data sets for these algorithms to perform well. And I think a lot of innovation, incremental innovation, will be needed to make um, these algorithms more uh, data efficient in similar ways. And that said, um, I think there are a number of tasks and domains that are likely to be unaffected, broadly speaking, by artificial intelligence and automation um, in the foreseeable future. Um, so what I set out to do in an earlier paper with Michael Osborne, who's at the um, Engineering and Sciences Department uh, here in Oxford, um, is to try to provide some framework for understanding which type of jobs that are most likely to be um, impacted by artificial intelligence going forward. 
And in this paper, we argued that there are sort of three key domains where human workers still hold the comparative advantage going forward. And those relate, broadly speaking, to creativity, complex social interactions, and perception and uh, manipulation tasks. So just to give you one example, if you think about these Loebner Prize competitions where chat bots try to convince human judges of them being a person, uh, there were some people that actually argue, argued that there was a breakthrough a couple of years ago when one chat bot uh, managed to convince 30% of human judges of it being a person. But it did so by pretending to be a 13-year-old Russian orphan boy speaking English um, as his second language without any real understanding of uh, English culture. I think if you think about the variety of much more complex in-person interactions that are still important, um, even to some extent in the age of COVID, and most certainly uh, thereafter, uh, there is uh, no way that we will have uh, algorithms that uh, do negotiations that are better at persuading people, that are better at motivating colleagues in the workplace uh, than humans are um, in the near future. So the question then becomes, how intensive are uh, jobs actually in tasks that correspond to these engineering bottlenecks to um, automation? Um, and to try to assess that, we went to a database called ONET, which provides very detailed descriptions and survey data about what people do in various occupations. And what we found in this paper is that there's actually a very broad set of occupations um, that do not really entail creativity complex social interactions and perception and manipulation tasks. So we estimate that roughly 47% of jobs are potentially um, automatable. Um, and it's not just in you know, production um, and back office work that is automatable. We find many jobs in transportation, logistics, construction, uh, food preparation, and so on that are um, exposed to artificial intelligence. And when we published this paper a couple of years ago now, we also provided a very detailed list of 702 occupations and, and their relative exposure to automation. And one thing that we did find is that fashion models are among the most exposed occupations in the United States and the United Kingdom. Um, and some people used to tease us for this. So Kenneth Cook here, my friend at The Economist, um, thought this was absolutely hilarious. And to be honest with you, so did we. Um, but it didn't take that long uh, until you actually have um, virtual fashion models. So the models that you can see on these pictures uh, for example, they have been generated by what is called gener generative adversarial networks from thousands of pictures. They have their own Instagram accounts. They're already being used by companies like Dior. Now, contrary to what was sort of the popular perception at the time, which is that these technologies are going to replace doctors and lawyers and a variety of very skilled um, professional service jobs, what we found in this paper is that the prob probability of automation is much higher in low wage and low education jobs. And when uh, President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors did some analysis based on our results, they found that 
the median probability of automation for occupations earning less than $20 uh, per hour was 83%. Those earning more than $40 an hour, uh, it's 4%. So huge uh, disparities. Conversely, what we do see is that, yes, new type of jobs are being created. And one way of identifying new jobs is by looking sort of at official occupational classifications decade by decade. And you can identify new job titles that emerged one decade that didn't exist in the previous decade. And what we do see is that before the computer revolution in the 1980s, new jobs were actually quite dispersed um, across space. And this is true both for Britain and the United States, I should say. Um, but beginning in the 1980s, we see these new jobs, and many of them relate to computer occupations like software engineers, database administrators, and so on. And these occupations are highly clustered in a few cities with already very skilled um, populations. But what we do see is that, yes, new jobs uh, are emerging, but they're very clustered to, to a few places. So we don't see sort of this broad-based job creation um, across communities that we did see back in the 1970s. And obviously, this is something that many believe might be impacted by COVID, uh, because we are now working remotely, and thereby there is some evidence to suggest that we don't necessarily need to cluster in these skilled and expensive uh, cities um, any longer. And if you look at some indicators of collaborative work, uh, like the average distance between inventors on the same patent, we do see that before the age of uh, digital technology and computers, the average distance between inventors of the same pattern was much, much lower uh, than it is today. So uh, there's been an enormous increase in this, the distance between uh, collaborators in uh, technology, which suggests that it's probably possible to do a lot of even complex skilled knowledge work uh, at distance. At the same time though, I think it's important to remember that all of these collaborators had to meet at some point, whether at work, whether at the conference, uh, whether uh, at a cafe or a bar or uh, whatever. And, and there is actually compelling evidence to suggest that when important conferences get cancelled, innovation and collaboration suffers as a consequence. So even if we can coordinate these complex pro projects at distance, uh, physical proximity still uh, matters. And I think a second point to make about this sort of switch to remote work that we're currently um, undergoing is that it's something that is not equally available to everybody. So when we look across industries, we find, for example, that roughly 80% of people in financial services can work remotely. If we look at leisure and hospitality, it's well below 20%. And overall, it's a sort of a relatively skilled, relatively high income industries and occupations that remote work is an option. It's less of an option uh, for many low income jobs, which have been, been worst hit by the pandemic and by people working remotely. Think of the 3,000 people being laid off at Pret, for example. That is largely a consequence of people no longer commuting to work, no longer buying 
that coffee or that sandwich uh, during their commute. Um, so I think it's important to remember that even during COVID, uh, many of the trends that we've been seeing in the labor market has, if anything, been exacerbated. It's people that are working computer using occupations generally that have fared um, quite well uh, during the pandemic, uh, relatively speaking. And it continues to be people in low skill, low income jobs that are most adversely affected by this. And I think one key difference to the first industrial revolution, which I think is worthwhile pointing out, which I also discuss in the book, is that the political economy of automation today is very different. Most workers um, are now also voters. They no longer have to vote with sticks and stones. They can simply show up at the ballot box. And I think the economist Leontief was onto something when he suggested that if horses could have joined the Democratic Party and voted, what happened on the farms might have been different. They could potentially have used their political voice to bring the introduction of labor-saving technologies like tractors um, on farms to halt. Um, and that is indeed what happened during uh, much of pre-industrial um, um, times. Craft guilds and workers often quite vehemently resisted labor replacing technologies. Now, we haven't seen the same sort of resistance today, but I think there is some evidence to suggest that people are becoming more um, concerned with automation. So this is a survey that was done by Pew Research before the pandemic, which suggests that the majority of Americans now uh, favor uh, policy measures to restrict uh, automation beyond hazardous jobs. In other words, they would vote for policies to limit um, the introduction of labor replacing technologies. And in addition to that, we have seen a number of strikes um, over automation. So what you can see on this, this picture is uh, dock workers at the harbor in Los Angeles striking over the introduction of autonomous cargo trucks. Um, and if we look at attitudes towards automation uh, before and after the pandemic, most evidence actually suggests that if anything, people are more concerned with over automation now than they were before the pandemic. And I think that's quite intuitive um, because it's much worse losing your job during an economic downturn than it is to lose your job during a period when the economy is booming and there are a lot of alternative job options to choose from. And that's why automation anxiety was more pronounced during the Great Depression. That's why automation anxiety was more pronounced during three post-Korean War recessions. That's why automation anxiety was more pronounced in the aftermath of the Great Recession. And I think this time in that regard um, is no different. Even in China, which has become the factory of the world, manufacturing jobs are gradually disappearing. 
17.5 million manufacturing jobs have disappeared over the past five years. Um, and during the pandemic, automation um, has become more of a political concern uh, among the Chinese. So 56% uh, of respondents in this IE University survey in China would favor limits to um, automation compared to 27% uh, before the pandemic. So what do we then do with all of this? Well, there's a tendency to say that, you know, automation is a huge uh, societal challenge in the short run. It's going to make us better, better off in the long run. I think that's right. That's what I argue in the book. But then there is also the tendency to suggest that, well, of course, we have this big challenge um, in front of us. We need a really big response and preferably we need something like universal basic income uh, that supports uh, really everybody regardless of whether they have a job or if they don't have a job um, and i think that is somewhat um, of a distraction i think that there are many things that can be done to help people transition into new and better paid jobs rather than just sort of throwing money at the problem. Um, and um, I think the key concern with universal basic income, in my view, is that if it actually replaces existing welfare systems that target people at the lower end of the income distribution with something that's then received by everybody, it will, if anything, worsen income inequality, right? Because it will redistribute uh, welfare transfers to people at the lower end of the income distribution to people also at the middle and the um, uh, upper end uh, of the income distribution. Um, and in addition to that, I think it doesn't really solve the, the problem that most people actually want to work. Uh, a lot of survey evidence suggests that people who work are happier than those who don't. Um, and um, that is an amazingly robust finding across time and space. So I really think we need to think about policies that help people transition into new jobs um, and industries. And that, I should say, also includes geographic uh, transition. We do see that across Western economies, all the manufacturing cities are in decline. We see new jobs being clustered in um, service cities like London, like San Francisco, uh, like New York and Munich and so on. Um, and we see that housing supply in those cities hasn't kept pace with demand for housing in those places. And as the demand for housing has been going up, uh, but supply hasn't expanded, uh, prices have been go going through the roof. And a lot of people can actually not afford to live in places where new jobs um, are emerging. And I think actually um, um, that cities are going to become more important after the pandemic because a lot of these routine rule-based activities um, that we see in our economies are increasingly going to become automated and offshored and what we're going to be left with is more of these exploratory um, type of tasks knowledge work uh, work around surrounding innovation which still benefits from knowledge spillovers and, and proximity so i think solving the housing issue as a tremendously important part of this puzzle. I also think that there is a lot that can be done through smart infrastructure um, investment. So where I grew up in southern Sweden, for example, Malmö was a city that was doing quite poorly economically throughout the 1990s because it used to specialize in building ships. And when the shipyard uh, closed down, it affected the entire local economy. A decade later, along comes the bridge to Copenhagen, which allows people 
the stay put in Malmö were housing a still sheep, commuting to Copenhagen, where there's an abundance of well-paying jobs. Most people would then spend their earnings locally where they lived in Malmö, which in turn um, gave a boost to the local service economy there and created new jobs in restaurants, in uh, arts and, and creative industries and, and so on. Finally, I think there are things that can be done actually to make businesses invest more in enabling technologies that create jobs and uh, create new industries rather than in replacing technologies with which put pressure on wages and um, reduces the demand for labor. And that can be done, for example, through the tax system. So what's been um, sort of a key trend uh, across advanced economies over the past four, uh, three to four decades or so is that taxes on capital have been going down and taxes on labor have either been flat or increasing. And what that means is that you're increasingly sort of providing more incentives for businesses to automate away labor rather than investing in technologies that save capital. And I think that is also one of the reasons why we've seen this episode of increasingly labor replacing technological change. And I think unless we change the tax code, we are also more likely to invent artificial intelligence that replaces workers rather than augments them or creates new types of tasks. So I think they'll end on that note and happy to take any questions? Thank you. If anybody has any questions, perhaps they can type them in the ch chat box or put your hand up. Thank you um, very much, Carl. If if I could perhaps kick off while we're waiting for some questions to come through. Um, I think one of the um, fallouts, if you like, of the of the um, pandemic has been the identification perhaps of, of what you'd call key workers, which may not have been identified before the pandemic as key workers, um, many of which probably were below the radar and the like. Um, do you think Automation and the like will will alter the way those those jobs um, will evolve in the in the short and medium term. That's a really great question. So I think many of the key worker jobs are in person type of care jobs, jobs in healthcare, jobs in schools. I think many of those tasks are quite hard to automate because they center on these sort of complex social interactions which i alluded to earlier um, are still very hard um, to automate and um, at the same time we do see hospitals increasingly using robots to transport food and medicine uh, to patients to maintain social distancing and hinder the spread of the vi virus but those technologies haven't really reduced the demand for labor in those places. If anything, you know, um, actually helped uh, doctors um, and nurses. And I do hope that at some point that organizations like the NHS will become more digitized. Um, I think it's still the largest buyer of fax machines uh, in the United <laughs> Kingdom. Uh, if not in the world. Um, so uh, I think there's some hope that we will have more technology to reduce, uh, increase productivity in healthcare uh, in particular. Uh, but I do think that those jobs are unlikely to be replaced, and which is probably reassuring for many people uh, working in those jobs. Hmm. I do think, however, that many jobs that, you know, 
uh, are important service type of jobs in restaurants, in coffee shops, are increasingly likely to be automated. So people uh, are even after this pandemic and when a vaccine arrives, a lot of people suggest that they don't want to get into crowded spaces, they don't want to take the subway, they don't want to get into an elevator, um, and they're more likely to want to interact with potentially an automated barista or sort of a vending machine at a lunch place rather than a waiter. So I do think that it's likely to spur automation in those two ways. Mm. Right, thank you. Um, we've got some questions coming in from the audience now. Um, I'll, I'll just read the first one. one this one's from Ruby. Um, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing it correctly. Um, with our human relationship towards AI changing in the world of work, are we in the midst of a new AI driven division of labor? 2.0 revolution. So are we facing a new AI driven division yeah. of labor? So that's essentially what, what I argue in the book is that uh, in the past, up until the past um, uh, decade or so, automation was largely confined to root, routine, repetitive activities that needed to be specified by programmer top down in order for automation to happen. And what we now increasingly see is that increasingly flexible machine learning algorithms are able to infer the rules of the game themselves through trial um, and error. And that expands the potential scope of automation quite significantly. So we are in this new era of uh, labor replacement with the potential scope of automation expanding well beyond these routine rule-based activities uh, to which computerization used to be uh, confined uh, up until 2012, 2013 or so. Um, we've got a, another question from Aaron. What is your point of view on Robert Gordon's productivity gap in new technology innovation uh, since 2000 versus 1870 to 1970? So I think Robert Gordon is right about the past. I don't think he's right about the future. Um, so for those who don't know uh, Robert Gordon's book, it's called The Rise and Fall of American Growth. It's a very uh, good book and essentially argues that the great inventions that caused productivity growth um, to rise to unprecedented levels in the post-war era can't be repeated. They can only happen once and we are very unlikely to see anything like it uh, even in the future. And a related thesis put forward by Tyler Cowan suggests essentially sort of the same story, but suggests that, you know, there was a lot of low hanging fruit during this era from uh, mass production, from electrification, from the uh, internal combustion engine, which uh, were behind a lot of sort of the growth upsurge in the post-war um, era. Those low hanging fruits have now been picked um, and therefore, um, you know, it's just getting harder and harder uh, to get um, productivity growth. Um, but I think this is sort of a strange way of thinking about it because what science does, it allows us to build higher ladders and climb further up the trees to pick uh, the fruit that it's higher up. So I do think that with artificial intelligence, which is in many ways also a method of invention, which can usually also aid progress in science um, across a variety of disciplines, I think we will make some very important discoveries also in the future that I think are likely to cause productivity to rise again, whether it will sort of grow to the levels of the post-war era or even exceed them, I think is still very much an 
open question and an unanswerable one. Um, but uh, I th think there are good reasons to believe um, or be optimistic, or more optimistic at least, than uh, Bob Gordon about uh, future productivity growth. Okay. We've got another question from Ashok. Um, it's something that's popped up in other talks that we've had. Um, how is globalization going to be affected by automation? Are products and services more likely to be sourced locally? So th that's a really good question. So, mm. so far at least, we haven't seen a big wave of reshoring as a con consequence of automation. So, I mean, the theory is essentially that if you can produce in automated factories and with 3D printing and so on, uh, if you can cut out labor um, and save transportation costs, it makes a lot more sense to produce um, pr produce locally, um, uh, which essentially would uh, make it harder for uh, low-income countries to develop because the way they grown rich in the past is through industrialization and shifting labor from agriculture to semi-skilled work. Um, in factories. The evidence actually so far suggests that uh, automation increases trade, if anything. And I think it's because uh, if you automate some activities, you often need a lot of components uh, which uh, are often produced outside the borders uh, of the country in which you automate. So the evidence from Mexico and Spain and other places actually suggests that when you automate, you actually import more stuff as well. Uh, which increases uh, global trade and um, globalization. Whether that trend will continue or not, I think is still an open question. Uh, there are obviously a lot of political pressures now to move production back home uh, for reasons that have to do with geopolitical competition with China, which have to do with uh, countries wanting to become more sovereign independent when it um, comes to responding to catastrophes like this pandemic um, and maybe that will change uh, the equation but for now it doesn't seem that automation has actually uh, led to a reversal um, of globalization okay good um can i ask a question actually um you 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 refer to enabling technologies and replacing technologies. Can you give me a, a few examples of each? Um, I'm just trying to get a bit more of a a handle on the, the the separation between these two solutions, if you like. Sure. So I mean, there are a lot of sort of intermediate technologies where it essentially becomes an empirical question whether it creates more sort of new tasks than it replaces. But I think the sort of clear, most clear cut examples are automatic elevators. So the automatic elevator got rid of the elevator operator. It replaced yes. a particular person and it didn't uh, do uh, much else. Um, another example of an enabling technology would be a telescope, right? So with the telescope didn't uh, you know, replace any people, it allowed us to do new and inconceivable things. If you think about a robot uh, being introduced in a factory, well, you may need some robot technicians and engineers, um, and uh, you may need fewer assembly workers. So that becomes then an empirical question, and the empirical evidence suggests that in the United Kingdom and the United States, robots have reduced employment. So yes, it may have created some jobs for technicians and engineers, but overall it's been replaced. Okay, all right. In the, in the context of that answer, what would you call escalators? Are they enabling, or, since they're very similar to <laughs> lifts? Well, it becomes an empirical question and I don't have the empirics on that, so uh, <laughs> okay. uh, I'll dodge that one. <laughs> good, good dodge. In thinking about sort of where we go in the future, one of the the, the big problems uh, at the moment is obviously climate change. Um, 
Though obviously that's going to require new and different jobs and maybe some of the people that are, 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 are put out of work by automation could move into those new fields and the like. But do you think we ought to be more um, uh, proactive in a sense of, of sort of um, concentrating automation on these new areas and, and letting the, the old areas that we could automate and leaving them alone essentially so that we can keep people in in employment in those old jobs while we concentrate on on perhaps the new ones or doesn't that work <laughs> so i think it's i mean it, it's it's hard in a way so i mean i, I clearly think if you look at you know, what's happened in the united states over the 2000s with both chinese imports coming in and robots um, there's a case to be made that you know a slower transition would have been less disruptive for the workforce and uh, if people had been better able to adjust to that uh, we might have been in a different situation now economically um, and politically at the same time i think it's very very hard to manage and once you sort of you know begin to protect industries uh, you create new sort of interest groups and there's a risk of that becoming permanent. So, I mean, yeah. over the long run, we want structural change, right? Most of these new jobs over the long run are better. Uh, it's nicer to work in a restaurant than it is to work in a coal mine. Uh, not that I would know from personal experience, but you know, going back in history and reading some of the news articles, uh, about coal mining, I mean, people wouldn't see daylight sometimes for a week. Cave-ins and explosions were part of everyday working life. Lung disease was often part uh, of the work package. So um, overall, I'm very much in favor of structural change. But, you know, you can envision a situation where change is just happening too rapidly for people to adjust and there may be you know a case to be made for for slowing it down but i'm more in favor of um you know trying to help people to shift into new jobs um rather than you know conserving um old jobs i think um that mm. has a, a lot of risks of becoming permanent and um for for, for that reason um uh, I, I don't think that's a good idea in general. Hmm. Right. I think we're we're coming towards the end of the questions. We uh, Ashok has come back to us and uh, is re reinforcing the argument. Uh, he's saying here you can argue telescopes created new space industry where other planets can be exploited. There can be similar arguments for innovation through automation, can there not? So that I think new that's... that new industries can be created. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, new industries have been created uh, through uh, automation, but uh, I think you know the case of the telescope is that it didn't really you know replace any existing labor. So if you take robot robots for example, it's an automation technology and we have a, a number of careful studies showing that it's uh, labor replacing uh, on balance so i think the empirics on automation technology uh, over the past three decades is that it's been predominantly replacing that doesn't mean that no new jobs have been created but it means that the net effect is um, is negative mm, okay the, Edward um, has a question. Um, it's quite a long one. Can you actually see it on in your chat box, Carl? Or are you able to see it now? Uh, okay, I'll I'll read the question. This is from Edward. So replacement technology permits productivity to be maintained or increased with fewer workers. Enabling technology offers an unquantifiable unquantified amount of new employment opportunity. 
Do you have any view on how we might organize society to distribute the rewards of productivity? So I, I think we're, we're asking how do we wind back this, this gap that is, has started to appear from the 1980s onwards? Uh, well, so I think first of all, it's an excellent question, um, and I think uh, you know we 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 did invent the welfare state part as a response to creative destruction in employment. I mean, to be clear, most of um, the welfare systems were developed in response to the Great Depression, but it was also developed more broadly in response to a more churn uh, in the labour. Uh, market and if we look across countries, um, people are faring quite differently in Sweden or Denmark or Latin United States. Um, it's become quite clear during this pandemic that having a system where you lose your health insurance with your job uh, isn't, you know, the best way of organizing. Uh, your society um, and your economy. So um, it is important to remember that, you know, when we talk about the future of work, we're talking about many futures of work and the current state of work is also quite different um, across uh, different uh, countries. So, um, uh, I mean, even even how we organize uh, the labor market is, is, is very different. In Sweden, for example, over 85% of uh, uh, workers are associated with the union in the United States, something like 11%. So they're clearly sort of institutional and policy choices uh, that do matter. And I don't think we necessarily have to reinvent the wheel, but we need to sort of uh, learn from uh, history, which is what I tried to do in the book. And as a side note, if we look at the first industrial revolution, one reason um, it has been argued that it happened in Britain uh, was actually because Britain at the time did have a very generous welfare system for its time, it should be said, right? So the poor laws were distributing or redistributing something like 2% of GDP, which was absolutely unheard of uh, during um, that time. And we see that resistance to mechanization was uh, less common actually in places where the poor laws were more generous. So having you know, some sort of a welfare state, it seems actually helped smoothen the transition and, and reduce resi uh, resistance to uh, mechanization. Okay. We've got another excellent question coming from Ruby. Um, do you have a feel for which of the world cultures are more open to AI and automation compared to those who are not and why? Wow, that's a tricky one. Um, yeah. So broadly speaking, I think different cultures are likely to take different approaches to artificial intelligence. Um, societies which have very little um, concern over data privacy are likely to take more privacy intrusive uh, approaches to artificial intelligence, uh, such as deep learning. And in this case, I'm primarily thinking of China. And um, I think Europe, where GDPR, for example, has sort of increased uh, the cost for businesses of uh, gathering and storing data that is likely to uh, impact on the type of um, inventions we see in the field. So it's possible that you will see less um, privacy intrusive approach to artificial intelligence, such as symbolic. Um, AI. Uh, in the end of the day, I think it's going to be sort of some sort of mixed uh, methods approach. Uh, but I do think that there is a case to be made that different world cultures are taking somewhat 
different approaches to artificial intelligence. Good, thank you. Perhaps could perhaps could I ask a question? It um, it, it struck a chord when you said, of course, that um, I think it, just before the industrial revolution some of the changes that the people in their lifetime didn't actually see any of the benefits. I mean, ultimately, technology change produces positive effects for society, but people were not seeing it in their lifetime. So um, sort of on a slightly more personal level, if you were stood in front of a class of 20 somethings, uh, the 20-something children, what advice would you give them? It's fairly, no, quite an open response, you know, get involved in politics, follow this career, um, join a union. Well, what, what sort of ad advice would you give to them? Because if we can make their lives better, these this group of young 20-somethings, they will make society better. So they're going to enable it in in a, you know in their lifetime what would you say to them absolutely so i think that's a brilliant question um i mean i think first of all people have to figure out for themselves what they are good at uh, and in the end that is sort of what uh are what, what what provides the constraints for what you can do so when I was young, for example, I wanted to be a footballer. The only problem is I wasn't any good at it and there was no chance and that I would become one. Um, so I think you need to figure out what uh, your skills and gifts are. And uh, on the basis of that, um, figure out what sort of value you can uh, add. Um, for somebody who's a very gifted sort of mathematician or somebody who's very good with numbers and statistics, um, you know, artificial intelligence is a tre tremendously uh, promising field. But for somebody who is not, you know, there are a lot of ethical and um, socio-economic concerns that are relevant um, as well. Um, so I do think that, you know, communicating that technology and innovation is really, you know, the key driver of growth and prosperity of the long run. And if you can do something to foster innovation, if you can do something to make sure that the gains from those technologies are more widely shared or if you can do something to communicate even the relevance just of those topics uh, without necessarily you know being involved in the innovation process yourself that is tremendously uh, important um, it's quite striking actually that if we look at the geography of uh, where people become inventors it's very confined to places where a lot of innovation is happening. So children, for example, that have parents who are inventors are much more likely to become inventors themselves. Uh, children that grow up in cities where there's a lot of innovation going on are much more likely to become inventors themselves. So exposing other people to innovation and technology, I think is sort of key um, uh, thing. And I would encourage every young person to try to spend some time uh, with people that are inventing and developing these technologies that that are really uh, you know changing the world we live in okay thank you i i did have another question actually and your answer there is is kind of triggered prompted me to ask it um, sorry i'm sort of take asking a lot but um um, and it's something that's very important to me because we just we're, we're we're working remotely, but I work for an international company, and we constantly struggle with you know should should we be in, that person be in Japan or should they be in the UK in order to achieve how do we co-locate our projects? So what you you did touch on earlier, you said actually that 
physical location is still important, even though we're managing to work remotely. What are the aspects of physical co-location that, that are, remain important, even in this world where we're all working remotely? What was so it? For, for me as an academic, so when I write a new book or an article, in sort of the early days of the project, I want to go to dinners, to conferences, have a coffee with people, just brainstorm and discuss ideas. And it's not just, you know, about the discussions I want to have, it's about those sort of sporadic encounters. It's about many of the sort of offside chats that you have when you go to a conference. You don't go there necessarily for the presentations. You can watch those online. Um, and I think one thing that digital doesn't do is sporadic interactions. Um, okay. You know, go into these meetings and we leave the meeting room, but you don't have that little extra shit chat with on your way uh, out, and you don't go for that drink together. So one quite funny study actually from um, from which came out of the US recently is looking at prohibition in the 20s and 30s and its impact on innovation. And what it does show is that many people who used to meet at the bar, their social networks are disrupted by this. And it actually takes some time for them to rebuild so new social networks. And innovation actually suffers quite significantly during a number of years uh, because of that. So I think there's sort of these, broadly speaking, two types of tasks. It's the exploration process in the beginning, when you decide what you want to do, you develop a new prototype, you're just starting a new project. And then there's the execution phase, which becomes sort of more routinized and standardized. And when I write a paper, I want to be left alone and I often work from home. So I think there's this sort of exploration execution phase. And when you decide on location, I think if exploring and generating new ideas is important, then I think co-location is very important for those knowledge spillovers to take place. I think when something, something becomes more standardized and routine, it's less important. And then it can often also be automated and offshore. Um, so I, I think that those, uh, those interactions are still tremendously important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I think uh, looking at the time and, and the fact that we seem to have uh, uh, exhausted the questions, I think I'll just pull it to, together and just say thank you very much for an extremely interesting talk. Um, very thought provoking. I think it's the sort of thing that I'm going to go away um, and uh, come back with many more questions. <laughs> <laughs> As you think about this, it's one of these problems that seems to get the harder the, the more you think about it. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much for uh, sowing the seeds. Yeah, very interesting talk tonight. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for having me.